Hello, hello, hello. Good afternoon uh, to you or tick as appropriate wherever you are in the world. Welcome back to Japan's uh, medieval period. So today we will be in the Kamakura era where I left you last class and we'll be moving on into the, uh, what's known as the Ashikaga, also known as the Muromachi period from 1336 to 1573. Now, uh, this is our first of two lectures on uh, Zen art and particularly painting. And uh, so I want to begin with um, just explaining this school of Mahayana Buddhism. As I mentioned in conjunction with Pure Land Buddhism, Zen is uh, one of Japan's two most popular schools of Buddhism. So we've got these two, and as you'll soon see, their practice and their arts are as different as night and day. And um, so Zen, just like Pure Land Buddhism, is a school of Mahayana Buddhism. And uh, like other schools of Buddhism, it has its roots in India. Now, in the sixth century, a mytho-historical figure who is known in Sanskrit, uh, he, he was Indian, um, uh, his name was Bodhidharma. In the sixth century, he brings the school of Dhyana, as it's known in Sanskrit, to China. Now, you've already heard this term, Dhyana. What does Dhyana mean? Can, can you see I'm holding something in front of the camera? Yes, well, what is this? This is Dhyana Mudra. It means that the figure holding it is meditating. Dhyana literally means in Sanskrit, meditation or concentration. That's because these two are really the same thing. Now, in China, uh, in, uh, over the years, uh, this school of what begins in India as Dhyana, uh, it absorbs features from the indigenous Chinese religion and uh, philosophy of, um, of Taoism, making it a little different from what it was in its South Asian homeland. Now, uh, it, it took a while to really take off in China, uh, but it flourished at its heyday, both in terms of practice and art in China, during what's known as the Southern Song period from 1127 to 1279. Now, this school of Buddhism also traveled to Korea, where it is known as Son Buddhism, and Jap uh, Japan, where it is known as Zen Buddhism. Now, uh, I think just like uh, Pure Land Buddhism, Zen is um, more popular in Japan than certainly in Korea and even in uh, China, where it's um, even eclipsed Chan, both in practice and in its arts. By the way, this figure, Bodhidharma, as he's known in Sanskrit, we'll meet him in a second. He's very important uh, to Zen in its arts. In Japan, uh, you'll be happy to know, his name is a lot shorter. He's known as Daruma. And so Zen is introduced in Japan uh, from China in the seventh century. However, it doesn't really take off until the Kamakura period, the 13th century. And from there on, it um, becomes one of Japan's two most popular schools of Buddhism. So during the Southern Song period and the Kamakura period, there is a, there is, um, uh, contact, religious and artistic, cultural, political contact. Doors are open between China and Japan. However, the Southern Song period in uh, China 
comes to an abrupt end in 1279 when China is invaded by Mongols from the northern steppes, nor north of China from Mongolia. They rule, the Mongols rule China from 1279 to 1368. They also rule Korea um, as the Yuan Dynasty. And this is a period in China's history where they are ruled by what they consider to be uh, barbarians. Now, during the Yuan Dynasty in China, uh, this overlaps with the later Kamakura period. At this time, because Japan is an island nation, Japan is able to once again close its doors to the outside world because they are worried that the Mongols, just like they took over China, just like they took over Korea, that they were going to invade Japan. And they were right. The UN launched their naval fleet on uh, two occasions to from Korea to try and capture Japan. On both occasions, though, they were mysteriously defeated by calamitous storms at sea right off the coast of Japan. And in um, the in Japanese um, mytho history, that um, serendipitous um, uh, uh, being saved from Mongol invasion is attributed to the Kamikaze. Now, Kami, of course, are the Shinto deities. Kaze is wind. So the Kamikaze are the um, the uh, the deity uh, deities of the wind. So many Japanese believed that they were saved from this barbarian foreign occupation from their local deities, the Kamikaze, and. Many of you have already heard this term. Um, this is appropriately the name that Japanese um, fighter pilots uh, adopted in World War II, that they would be under the protection of the kami of the wind. During this period of the Yuan Dynasty in China, uh, the style, um, Chan uh, practice, Chan Buddhism, and its associated arts really fell out of favor in favor of, they were replaced by Tibetan esoteric Buddhism. And that is what the Mong Mongols practiced. So a number of these persecuted Chinese Chan monks fled to Japan where they were welcomed. And a number of the monks, as we're going to see in Zen as well, a number of the monks were also artists. And so they bring the practice, they train Japanese monk, monk artists, they also bring works of art. Um, but it's really after the, um, the fall of the UN that Japan reopens its doors and it reestablishes ties with China, which is um, from 1368 to 1644 under ethnic Chinese rule as the Ming Dynasty. So during the Ming period and during um, Japan's Ashikaga, also known as Muromachi period, once again, we've got uh, free trade, we've got political, cultural, and religious um, uh, ties between China and Japan. Uh, however, the uh, Chan Buddhism never really regained its widespread popularity that it had, uh, sorry, in China that it had um, enjoyed before the Mongol invasion. And um, the, the associated Chan arts, particularly the ink paintings that we're going to look at, they were never really as prized as they had been before the Yuan Mongol um, dynasty in China. So, and this is important to remember because Today, some of the most celebrated works of Chinese Chan Buddhist art are actually in Japan because 
monks coming to Chinese Chan monks coming to Japan brought with them works of Southern Song Chinese art um, as kind of gifts to Japanese monasteries and Japanese monk artists going to study in, um, in Ming Dynasty China, they were gifted with these works of art on paper that are highly portable. Why? Because in China, they were not as highly prized at that time. So that's why um, a number of the most celebrated works of Chan, um, Chan Chinese Buddhist art are actually in Japan at monasteries. Now, um, another thing to keep in mind is that one of the most bloody eras in all of East Asia coincides with the Ashkaga. Oh, I should say that um, the Ashkaga period from 1336 to 1573 in Japan has two names. And I gotta tell you this because you're going to be in your readings. It might be referred to as the Ashkaga Jidai period. Uh, that is the name of the shogunate family. Can, it's also called the Murumachi Jidai or the Murumachi period. That is where the Bakafu or the military government was based in what is now Kyoto. So two names, pick whichever one. Um, so this period in um, Japan's history, 1467 to 1650, coincides with the Ashikaga period and also the Momayama period, the next historical era. Shinga Sengaku Jidai means the country, the period of the country at war. It was a period of near constant warfare um, between different daimyo, different, um, different um, landed gentry, uh, and the, uh, the samurai, these um, elite warriors, had their work cut out for them. Now, I think this is one reason um, the Sengaku Jidai saw a, um, just a surge in the popularity of Zen. And that's because the way in which Zen is practiced was very appealing for, um, for martial times where people were constantly fighting. And more on that in a moment. The Sengaku Jidai finally ends in 1615, which is Japan's last, um, last pre-modern historical era, the Edo period. Zen practitioners of the religion were um, military. Uh, they were artists who were also priests. So it's you got the you got the priestly class and the members of the military. Those are the major figures of Zen uh, proponents of it and, and artists. Whereas Pure Land is more courtly, and a lot of women were major followers of Pure Land Buddhism. The works of art that we're going to be looking at, mostly um, ink on paper, which are called sumi-e, that's um, black ink on paper. Uh, these are examples, of course, of otoko-e, or men's painting, men's pictures, because they are from, or the style is very consciously from China. And also it's a it's Buddhist subject matter. They could, um, the works that we're going to see can also be called kara a Chinese paintings. And the style of painting also is very much associated with learned men um, called the literati in Chinese history, who just like the Zen paintings that we're going to see, literati Chinese painters practiced uh, their work uh, with black ink painting on white paper. And there's often um, uh, calligraphic inscriptions in very, very accomplished hand. So um, this is um, the school of Buddhism from its roots in uh, in South Asia is associated with um, meditation. Remember dhyana. 
And that is the backbone of Zen. Zen espouses total um, total control of your mind 24-7. Uh, and so whatever you're doing, if you are aware of your mind, your thoughts, your body, your breath, your surroundings at all time, that is essentially a meditation. The idea is that um, Zen practitioners aim to live their meditation 24-7. Zen is often referred to as um, a very practical religion because the idea is that anything that you're doing, as long as you're doing it with utter and complete mindfulness, that's a key, mindfulness, um, as long as you're doing that with mindfulness, um, it, it is a meditation and thereby any occasion, any activity is an occasion for enlightenment. Now think about where we are in, um, in Japanese history with this Sengaku Jidai. There are uh, hundreds of thousands of um, samurai soldiers. These people are skilled in the art of horse riding, um, horse, um, sorry, archery and sword play. And having this total awareness of themselves at all times is really good training for being on the battlefield. Because if you're constantly policing your thoughts and being aware of yourself, your surroundings, your body, your breath, that's a good tactic for fighting. If you lose sight of, um, of your mind, of of where you are for one moment on the battlefield, that's it. So Zen was a very good kind of mental and uh, spiritual training for hard military times. It, offer, it also offers this added spiritual benefit that remember, whatever you are doing at um, the moment, as long as you're doing it with mindfulness, according to Zen, it offers an occasion for enlightenment. Now, most schools of Buddhism um, consider killing, especially with another human being, uh, antithetal anti to practice. Buddhas, most schools of Buddhism practice non-harm, not harming another living being. However, um, Zen espouses, on the other hand, that if you are just killing mindfully, being on the battlefield is an occasion to become enlightened. So it has this added bonus, this kind of dual practical mind training, and it offers this pathway to enlightenment. Now, Zen is also is often um, considered to be iconoclastic, and that remember, anything that you're doing is an occasion to become enlightened. So a number of figures who become enlightened, they're, um, they're called patriarch figures um, because they, then they go on and teach. Um, a number of them gained enlightenment during doing things that uh, is um, considered to be um, prohibited in other schools of Buddhism, such as hunting, uh, such as visiting a brothel, such as gambling, as long as you're doing that with utter mindfulness, it is, um, it is part of the practice. And for this reason, Zen is often referred to as the religion of chopping wood and carrying water uh, because such mundane activities as well is an occasion to become enlightened as long as you're doing this with complete and utter mindfulness. Two major schools of Zen in Japan. One is Soto. Soto advocates a more gradual building up to enlightenment. And the idea is that you get these small flashes of satori, which is uh, enlightenment, um, but it's this build up over years and this cultivating of mindfulness and awareness. Rinzai, on the other hand, um, advocates that um, satori comes in a flash. And again, no matter what you're doing, uh, and so it's, um, it just, it comes to anyone in, um, a, a moment and it, you don't have to have practice just as long as you're doing it, boom, that Satori comes in an instant. 
So let's turn without further ado to some of the um, Zen, some of, some of the most celebrated Zen works of art. Now, this figure that I mentioned, the second patriarch, uh, Bodhidharma, in Japan is known as Daruma. And he is a much beloved um, kind of folk hero in Japan. He's got a very, um, a, a very recognizable iconography, which I'll um, discuss in a moment. And so uh, th this is painted by um, this hanging scroll. A hanging scroll, hey, I don't think we've um, encountered hanging scrolls before. In um, Japan, hanging Japanese, uh, hanging scrolls are known as kakimono. That's um, the, the hanging thing, essentially. And this work, um, this posthumous portrait of Daruma, is very much um, typical of... Um, these Zen kakimono. And um, it's painted by Seishu in the mid 15th century, one of the most celebrated Zen masters. Uh, he himself was a monk and he traveled to Ming, China. And uh, like many uh, Japanese Zen monks. He was welcomed into the royal repository. Um, of um, or the, the Royal Library of um, paintings and allowed to look at Southern Song Chan paintings and studied very assiduously uh, and he mastered these Chinese Southern Song Chan brushstrokes. And that's key. So looking at a painting such as this, we haven't seen um, style such as this. This is really the antithesis of Yamato A. Remember the Genji Monogatari Imaki with its blocks of color and gold and abbreviated faces, but um, very, very um, lavish and um, uh, highly, highly detailed. Now, the Zen paintings are really executed um, with um, minimalist brush strokes. And you can imagine that for someone like Seishu, this monk practitioner painter, that he was in complete awareness and control of his mind, of his heart and of his arm and the brush. To and, um, notice this execution of um, these brush strokes here. And he just renders Daruma's, um, uh, Daruma's body with these minimalist strokes, uh, very, very abbreviated. And these words should be appreciated by, by tracing with your eye how the, the ink was applied to the paper. And um, there's varying modalities of the thickness of the application of the ink. And you can imagine Seishu just whipping around his, um, his brush on the paper. And I want to draw your attention to, it seems very simple, it seems very childlike, but in fact, the Daruma's body, not turning to his face yet, but just the body, the way that it's executed in his heavy hemp monastic robes, um, so this represents complete mastery of the brush. Now, I want to draw your, your attention to this section here and a little bit here. Now, notice how the ink is heavy and then it becomes very light and wash-like. And you see that how this is achieved right here, there's these little tiny, tiny lines. And that represents having so, um, putting so little pressure on the brush stroke, uh, the, um, the brush that, uh, and, and having it so, um, so almost dry that it causes the bristles to separate and to show the white. And that's exactly what it's called in Chinese, fubai, the uh, flying white. So when the bristles separate, that's really hard to do, apparently. I have no um, 
I, I have no practice with um, ink painting, but um, it is the mark of a master to be, and then to switch. It, it, he clearly did not lift up the brush and then to moderate it so that it's that thick going around Daruma's so, shoulder there. So Sumi'i, once again, uh, it's an example of kara'e or Chinese painting. Um, Sumi'i is black, uh, black ink brush painting. Now, these, the majority of Zen paintings are indeed ink painting on um, paper. These are very, very cheap materials, very humble materials. And that is absolutely appropriate for Zen. Zen does not privilege one act over another as a path to enlightenment. Zen has little place for gilded images and sitting, um, uh, sitting in a lavish temple or praying to become enlightened. You can be on the battlefield. You can be doing something as mundane as chopping wood and carrying water, or raking gravel in a Zen garden as we'll see next class. Any activity is an occasion to become enlightened. So there's not this hierarchy of activities to become enlightened. Similarly, there's not a hierarchy of materials to create a Zen work of art. And that is really also, a, um, it, it's very much uh, in resonance with Buddhism in general, this no, what's called non-duality and not having um, attachment to one over the other. Also, uh, a number of the Chan and um, Zen painter monks in China and Japan were very poor. So this is the, um, th these are the materials that they could afford. And uh, I want to draw your attention now to this figure of um, Daruma, his face. Now, again, he is the, um, the second patriarch. The first patriarch of um, Zen Buddhism is um, the Buddha Shakyamuni. There are a number of patriarchs in Zen. These are figures who became enlightened and then taught, passed down the teachings and taught how to achieve this mindfulness. Now, um, the, all of the Zen patriarchs are depicted in, um, with these cartoon-like lines, well, the most celebrated paintings. We'll see a different style in a moment, but by and large, um, they are rendered in these cartoon-like sketchy figures, and their faces are also kind of, they're, they're shown as being dirty and dumpy. They're kind of overweight. They're balding. Uh, they're, they're shown as car cartoon-like and on the other hand, eminently relatable. So what that does is it shows us in all our humanity, with all our flaws, warts and all, that if these people can become enlightened, then so can we. And it makes them, it seems like it's so much more attainable then. Now, Daruma has an iconography of how a medieval Japanese artist, such as Seishu, who had never seen an Indian person before, how they imagined them to be. Now, um, Daruma, actually, his iconography is established in China. And um, artists such as Mu Chi, who we're going to meet in a moment, um, how they imagined a, an Indian person to look like because they had similarly never seen an Indian person, but they imagined they looked different from them. And so there was this kind of, throughout East Asia, there is this um, a kind of stereotype, um, politically incorrect stereotype um, that depicts South Asians as being um, hairier, with um, larger noses and um, with um, very heavy eyebrows um, and uh, very heavy, heavy beards as well. Now, um, so Daruma uh, is, um, that is how he's depicted. He's depicted as Seishu 
draw, drawing from earlier Chinese Chan models, how, um, how Chinese Chan artists had um, envisioned Indians to look because they knew Daruma was Indian. Now, Daruma also always has these wide staring eyes. And that's because according to his mytho history, Daruma, when he got to China, he was um, meditating in a cave and looking at the wall of the cave. And if you've ever meditated before, and, and practice type of meditation that is open eye, um, you probably had the experience of your eyelids growing very heavy, and kind of starting to fall asleep. And that indeed is what happened to Dharma. And he got so frustrated with himself with his, and his vexing eyelids that he ripped them off and threw them outside of the cave. And according to the mythology, from there sprung the first tea plants in China. And uh, it's for this reason, it's, well, one reason why um, tea is so much associated with Zen, it also keeps um, novice monks awake while they're meditating. So Daruma, that is his iconography uh, as a uh, uninformed yet stereotypical depiction of a South Asian. He is shown wearing this very rudimentary, probably hemp um, you know, cloak and <coughs> big nose um, to show him as the other, and <coughs> especially his wide staring eyes. And this is the type that is executed over the ages. These are two much later depictions of Daruma during the Edo period. Um, Fugai Ekun on the left, these are two of um, two celebrated um, Edo era painters of Zen Kakemono. Uh, uh, and again, we can always recognize the figure through this kind of um, this very rudimentary and um, cartoonish, like sketchy depictions of the um, of the robe, and then this kind of hunched over figure with the big nose, the straggly beard, and above all, these staring eyes. And Daruma is, for reasons that we'll uh, see in a moment, he's always depicted as this kind of middle-aged cantankerous guy, kind of almost like a hobo-like figure or something. Um, but, and he's almost, he's a beloved kind of folk hero in Japanese um, Zen Buddhism. Uh, and here, as we're going to see, and coming from China, there is this union of painting poetry and calligraphy. This is a educated gentlemanly or literati pastime coming from China. And here we have an example of this. Um, uh, Hakuhun Ikaku in the mid 18th century, above the painting, the ink painting of Daruma, he's written direct pointing at the mind of man, seeing one's nature and becoming Buddha. This refers, of course, to this constant living of one's um, living one's meditation and pointing at the mind and seeing one constantly examining oneself as a um, as a path to become enlightened, to become a Buddha. I, a, this is another. Um, Kakemono, hanging, um, hanging um, scroll from the Edo period. But um, one of my favorite uh, kind of aspects of uh, Daruma's um, mytho history is that he's said to have um, traveled across the Yangtze River, a very large river. Um, in, oh, sorry, this is from the Momayama period, the next period uh, in Japan, um, from, <clears throat> from the late 16th century. So um, 
Daruma is said to have traversed the, one of uh, China's most mighty rivers, uh, the Yangtze, on a reed. I mean, of course, this is physically impossible, that, but that he just mounted it and he was able to kind of surf along this mighty river. That's a contribution of Taoism. Taoism, this, um, this uh, indigenous um, mytho, um, or sorry, um, religio-philosophical tradition from China and has all of these com magical components, these um, supernatural components, such as being able to surf on a reed. And um, the painter here, Kano Soshu, from the, um, from the Momoyama period, um, I just want to point out this um, brush work here. This um, very light ink washes here that executes the unkempt hair. And again, the pleasure in um, executing these works of art and um, uh, viewing them is tracing the brush strokes. So here you can imagine that um, Soshu is just dabbing with a barely saturated brush, dabbing to, um, uh, to execute the beard here and these, um, uh, the heavy, eye, um, the heavy um, eyebrows. And then again, a little bit of fubai here and moderating the pressure on the brush. And this is very, very different. Again, totally different execution, totally different aesthetic from Yamato A. And Oh, this, I should have had this on the previous image, but uh, here we are um, in J Japanese art. Um, Shigajiku is this um, hanging scroll with a literary inscription, that's what we've got up here, written above an ink painting, very much associated with Zen. Now, again, this is coming from uh, literary traditions, gentlemanly practices, uh, in uh, China. And in China, even before the Momoyama period, there was a well-established tradition of gentlemen getting together and one person producing a painting and then um, at that moment or a later moment, someone else um, composing a poem or thinking of an older poem and then in flawless calligraphy um, executing that above the painting. So the calligraphy could be done by the original artist or uh, by a later person. So here the calligraphy is um, later, uh, Gyokushitsu Sohaku, and he writes, so um, clearly inspired by, um, by Soshu's painting, lightly sailing on a single reed. He is majestic and commanding. Far away from the land in the south, uh, what does he recall? And it really looks like he was inspired to write that in kanji, of course, in Chinese characters. He looks like he is kind of gazing southward. Remember, he is from India. And he is this formidable, heavy presence. Uh, and again, he's balancing on this very delicate reed as he's surfing along the mighty Yangtze River. So uh, this practice of uh, Shigajiku, very, very much associated with Zen, um, Zen art in Japan. This is an example of a Chinese Southern Song painting, uh, a hanging scroll, and uh, it's by an anonymous artist. And it depicts a uh, very popular uh, depiction in let's say, Bodhidharma or Daruma's hagiography. A hagiography, once again, we have encountered this word uh, before, but a hagiography is the life of a sacred person. Because Daruma is a patriarch, we can refer to events in his life as um, hagiography. So 
this um, this hanging scroll was likely brought to Japan uh, and um, and later artists um, copied it, and it's a type. Now we know that um, Daruma meditated in a number of uh, caves and that was his uh, Zen practice. He would stare at the wall of the cave and remember the occasion where he got so fed up with his eyelids that he ripped them off and threw them out of the cave. Um, news traveled far and wide that a Buddhist master had come to town and people wanted to study with him but he wanted to be left alone. Daruma did not want to take on pupils. And here we see him meditating, just facing the wall. We can recognize him from the swiftly executed uh, monastic robes, his kind of uh, thick, uh, slovenly figure, um, beard, et cetera, and these staring eyes. A one figure by the name of um, Hakuhun, or Eiko, as um, Eiko in Japanese, he was so desirous of studying with this um, master that uh, he came several times. Each time, uh, Daruma turned him away, not taking any teachers. And so finally, um, Eiko cuts off his arm and offers it to Daruma. That shows Daruma how serious this um, man is, what he's, the lengths he's willing to go to, to um, become, uh, to study with him. So this is essentially, works like this are essentially the models that Japanese painters such as Seishu are um, drawing from, and they're learning these calligraphic brushstrokes, these abbreviated brushstrokes, and um, even though we don't know the artist, the original Chinese artist, we can still appreciate these very different types of um, ink brushstrokes. Notice the way in which this rock crag is executed, the modulating the pressure, the saturation of the brush. And this is Seishu's, um, uh, Seishu's um, rendition of the same um, the, the same episode from Daruma's uh, hagiography. So here we have um, Hueko offering his arm to Daruma. Again, a hanging scroll. This is from the Ashikaga Muromachi period. It's dated 1496. And all of this rendition of the interior of the cave, this is not executed in these, um, these cartoon-like brush strokes. This is a lot more laborious. And this is very much in the Chinese landscape tradition. At, um, so Seishu, once again, he traveled to Ming Dynasty China and he learned very well from uh, older examples of Chinese art. And he's really mastered these different Chinese techniques. Here, Daruma is seated staring very intently at the wall. And notice the figure of um, Hueco here, he looks like this furrowed brow and he's got this, he is, is offering his um, severed arm to Daruma as um, to show him, I am willing to do anything to be able to study with you. And his face does not express pain, which undoubtedly he would have been feeling. It's more just this intensity of, um, you can imagine him thinking, gosh, I hope he takes me now. Do I have to cut off my leg or my head next time to get his attention? And um, it went, again, you can trace every line that Seishu has executed here. And this um, de depiction of um, the cartoon-like face, this intense figure that, um, Daruma is because of uh, the um, his uh, the fact that he would just turn people away. He would ignore them. Um, he's considered to be really a heavy taskmaster. And notice how you can really see Seishu was dabbing 
the um, the brush and then dragging it across the body, uh, the forearm to articulate Daruma's body. Very, very light ink, um, a very light painting here to show his pink complexion. So Daruma is, as I mentioned, a kind of beloved folk hero in Japan. On one hand, he's this kind of cantankerous, middle-aged man. He's known to be very cranky, um, but he also is very, very beloved. And you see him not just in Zen works of art, but um, throughout Japan in the more, in more popular contexts, such as in the form of these paper mache Daruma dolls. And Daruma dolls are sold at um, many different, not just Zen temples throughout Japan. And you buy them like this. Well, formal analysis first. They're kind of like, um, they, they have no arms or legs. They've just got this sketchy, rudimentary face. And when you buy them, they're pupilless. Uh, it's, um, it's said that after um, meditating for years and years, um, not moving, Daruma, uh, his limbs um, just withered and fell off. So he, um, this shows him in this kind of lump-like form as he's been meditating with no limbs. And um, these, you can, they're weighted on one end. And so this is a metaphor for the fact that you can knock someone over in their meditation. They have, um, they, they might have trials, but they just fall back into it. They, um, they weight themselves back up. So when you buy these Daruma dolls, um, the, the merchant will put one pupil in and you make a wish. And then when you get that wish, you bring it back to the temple and the merchant will put the other um, pupil in and then they are burned ritually every year. This does not happen, these Daruma dolls don't exist anywhere else in any other Zen, Chan, uh, Dhyana tradition. Uh, and I think this burning goes way back, it reminds me almost of the dogu that are smashed, we think, after, um, perhaps after they fulfilled their purpose. And it also kind of reminds me of Shinto, right? The great Jungu Shrine at Issei and a number of other shrines are burned um, uh, on a regular schedule to keep this purity when they have exhausted their purpose, they're destroyed. And a number of temples have these mass Daruma doll burnings annually. So uh, it's not just the figure of um, Daruma that is a celebrated patriarch number of other ones. I think the, one of the most um, famous is the figure Wanang, who was Chinese, historical figure. He lived from 638 to 17, 713. And this is a Chinese example uh, by one of the most celebrated Southern Song Chan painters, Liang Kai. Liang Kai himself was a Chan um, monk. And just like with Seishu, looking at um, one of Liang Kai's paintings, you can see that similarly for Liang Kai, um, painting was a meditation. It was a, a um, it was executed with complete presence of mind. Liang Kai, just like Seishu, uh, while he was executing the painting, he was not thinking about anything else. He was just complete control over the brush, his body, the ink, as he, with these mindful brush strokes, is creating these very characteristic, sketchy, monochrome ink paintings. Now, in China, these um, calligraphic monochrome, um, um, monochrome works of art express what is known as xi or writing the idea. And so it's this, um, uh, this performative kind of calligraphic brush strokes or, or writing the spontaneous idea. <coughs> Whoa, excuse me. <coughs> 
Notice you can trace each line of um, Yang Kai's brush stroke here. <coughs> Little dab for the, um, the notch on the bamboo and then just a dab for um, the, the horizontal element of the bamboo. Very light wash for the land here. Um, Liang Kai, Liang, um, Liang Kai is depicting Guanang, who is the sixth patriarch. Like a number of these other patriarchs, the patriarchs in Zen are every men. They are no one special. A lot of times they were illiterate villagers like Wanang, who was a, um, someone who just worked at a temple and he was um, sent off by the monastery to go fetch some firewood. And as he is chopping the bamboo with his little ax here, listening to that sound, bamboo is hollow, and listening to the thop, Stock, stock of the um, of, of his little knife, he had this flash of enlightenment, this satori, and uh, it was his moment. He became enlightened at that moment. So once again, Rinzai, enlightenment, no matter who you are, as long as you're doing it with complete and total awareness, um, anything is an occasion to become enlightened, chopping wood, carrying water. And of course, it's a metaphor that bamboo is hollow because according to Buddhism, nothing really exists. Everything, this whole world is what's known as Maya. And so it's the, the fact that bamboo looks very heavy and it looks very solid, but it's not. In fact, it is, um, it is hollow inside. And Wanang is shown um, here very characteristically, he has an iconography. He's wearing these rags uh, and he's very dirty and he's wearing these very um, simple uh, straw sandals. He is balding, he has, um, he's dirty. He's, as I describe, I like to think of these patriarch figures who have achieved the ultimate goal of Buddhism, they become enlightened. I, the way in which they are depicted by these um, monk painters is like the Homer Simpson of medieval China and Japan. They're shown as scruffy, they're shown as dumpy, they're shown as wearing rags, but they're relatable. If, so, if a illiterate peasant can gain enlightenment from having something as simple and as difficult as presence of mind, well, so can you then. So turning to um, Kano Tanyu of the Edo period, the se uh, 17th century, he has similarly taken up this topic of um, the sixth patriarch of Zen at the moment of enlightenment. Once again, he depicts Wanang, and we can tell that it's him because we have this scruffy, figure wearing these ragged clothes um, and with his unkempt beard, he's balding and he is hacking away at a bamboo. That's all you need in the Zen context and immediately everyone would know. So he's taking Liang Kai's iconic image. By the way, Liang Kai's, um, uh, I didn't write this on here, but Liang Kai's hanging scroll is one of these treasures that the, um, uh, the Ashikaga Zen, paint, Zen monk painters would have brought back with them from their travels in China. And this hanging scroll lives in Japan now. It's not in a Chinese collection. Um, so uh, Tanyu writes here, um, so once, ag once again, this very Zen um, and uh, Chinese literati practice, he, the, in beautiful calligraphy, kanji, Chinese characters, he writes an appropriate poem. One strike of a knife vanquishes all thoughts. Green jade of bamboo scattered over the earth, mountains and rivers. Yet there is enough left in front of Yashokuken to turn thousands of acres of land along the Wei River into desolation. Now, this is referring to the Chinese 
landscape, the Wei River, very famous river in um, China that I doubt that Tanyu had ever seen. No, the Edo period was closed off again in Japan and no one was allowed to leave. So um, Tanyu could not have seen it. But he knows that uh, Wanan, the sixth patriarch, lived in China and he knew these, um, these sites. So um, he is referring to the Chinese landscape. So he's taken the Japanese Edo uh, era painter who um, Tanyu uh, himself was similarly a um, monk painter. He takes Liang Kai's more uh, detailed painting and he really distills it down to the very, very um, minimal. And he's using a lot thicker, more saturated brush for the body. Look at this, and you can imagine this presence of mind. He's totally there. He's completely mindful. And <laughs> you can see him just executing these strokes for Lenang's body. Notice the very, very different strokes, though, for the wash, the very dilute ink for his hair. And then the moderated thubai, the parted brush, uh, and then with the thicker, more um, assurance, alternating with the bamboo here. And then just the dabbing and lifting off of each bamboo um, and bamboo leaf. Another very, um, celebrated uh, Zen figure or Chan figure in China, not one of the patriarchs, but someone who uh, was, um, had a smaller in the, Sator, um, in the Soto sense, a uh, limited flash of enlightenment. And um, the shrimp eater uh, is a figure who was, um, associated with a monk. He was kind of a hermit monk. And um, in most schools of Buddhism, it, vegetarianism is um, espoused. If possible, please be a vegetarian. But whatever you do, don't actually kill animals, any living being. Um, and so uh, here we have this figure who is clearly shrimping. He has his um, he has his net and he's um, dipping into the water and carrying up um, carrying up plump shrimp, and he's doing this with so much mindfulness that um, he has this flash of enlightenment. This is uh, executed by one of the most another very celebrated Southern Song um, monk practitioner. Uh, Lu Muchi Fachan. And um, the shrimp eater, here it depicts the shrimp eater, but this um, monk uh, who was very, very poor is also known as Monk Clan. And um, Muchi uh, uh, depicts him, again, economy of brushstroke, very, very calligraphic. Look at that. Um, incredible lower garment. And that is certainly depicted with a thicker, more saturated brush. Look at where he lifts the brush off to show with kind of the tatter of the um, one um, part of the material is kind of in the breeze. And then this is kind of quick calligraphic strokes for his, um, for uh, the tied up kind of backpack here. Um, and then the much more laborious um, bamboo. And, um, but look at that face, man, that is a very, very happy monk. I have to say, I'm really trying not to eat shrimp, but like the monk clam, I so enjoy it. And I look like that when you put shrimp in front of me too. He is so happy and he is, catching these shrimp with so much mindfulness. He is so in the moment that he's got this flash of enlightenment. Uh, and um, another person, um, another monk, a, inscribes the uh, calligraphy up here. And all of this happened in, um, in China, in Southern Sung China. So this um, poetic couplet up here reads, 
picking up his net at random and dragging it through the mud, wading across the water, illicit good goods emerge before him. He comes face to face with this troublesome, with this troublesome taboo. He's conflicted, and I know the feeling. I, too, am trying to be better and not eat living things, but, man, I love shrimp, and I'm hoping to have a flash of enlightenment the next time I'm served a plate of a shrimp cocktail. Uh, so, again, Buddhism, Zen Buddhism being um, iconoclastic, thwarting the rules of, um, of most um, traditional schools of Buddhism. And this is a um, 14th century Japanese depiction of the very same uh, topic. And we can tell because the work is executed in an inimitably Zen style that it is a work of Zen. And as such, with the topic of a ragged man who is barefoot with this unkempt, um, beard, he's middle-aged, he's clearly a peasant, but holding um, shrimp and with a shrimp catcher, we can tell that is the iconography coupled with the style, the execution of the brushwork. It could only be the shrimp eater, this monk clam guy. And again, a just delighted face that he is so happy with his prize here, the illicit goods. And the painter, um, Kao, who seals uh, our Kao and Nga, uh, he, again, he's completely mastered these ultimately Chinese um, Southern Sung, uh, calligraphic brush strokes up here and and also we're given with these um, Zen paintings we're given the bare minimum of details to allow us to recognize a body uh, in these ragged clothes and just and then lifting off and then back over here dragging the brush along on um, I love the way this contrast with these, um, this is his sash that are holding these very um, tattered, very tattered trousers up. These are executed last and this is the most, um, the, the darkest elements, the brush is the most saturated than it is anywhere else in the painting. But we're given just the bare minimum to understand the, um, landscape elements. This is a overhanging rock here. This is a jetty onto the water. Minimal brush strokes, very abbreviated, very calligraphic and cartoon-like. The first patriarch, the Buddha. And uh, the Buddha is similarly depicted in uh, very not respectful way in Chan and Zen. The Buddha himself is depicted in a kind of everyman way. He's shown as a real person is and becomes so much more relatable. The most celebrated depiction of, um, uh, of the Buddha in um, Chan art is Liang Kai, whose work we just saw, Liang Kai's Siddhartha emerging from the mountains. So properly speaking, uh, this is not the Buddha yet. It's still Siddhartha. He has left the palace. He's given up his um, princely station, but he has not yet become enlightened. And uh, this was painted in 1204. A little unusual in um, Chan and Zen art, and that these are luxury materials. This is um, ink and mineral pigment, a little bit of color, mineral pigment, on silk hanging scroll. So um, sometimes these artists did have access to more costly materials, but the best known and um, most common works of Chan and Zen painting is the very minimalistic ink on paper. So um, here we have a moment from uh, the historical Buddha's hagiography. 
he was uh, at, at one point he wandered off into the um into the wilderness into the mountains and he was meditating and he felt like he wasn't getting any closer at all to the goal of enlightenment and uh he had left civilization spent um quite a bit of time in the elements and he comes back very very despondent from the mountains and Liang Kai depicts uh, Siddhartha, um, Siddhartha Gautama, um, very, very much as he would have been. We see him with tattered monastic robes. They're frayed and dirty at the bottom. He's got these filthy feet with long toenails. He is, um, he, his, he's unshaven, his beard is scraggly, and I think even more poignant, notice his, um, his arm is dirty. Notice though, the look on his face, he looks really despondent. He looks like he's just about to give up. And those of you who have gone camping, you know that after some time in the wilderness, you do look dirty. Your feet are, um, you need a pedicure. And maybe your beard, if you're a guy, uh, is, um, very disheveled. So it's a very relatable image. And this is just unprecedented. In this is the first, one of the first times in Buddhist art that uh, a, a, an artist, an artist who was also a monk, gives such an unflattering depiction of the founder of the faith. It's, um, it, it's not, um, sanitized. It's showing him as he must have been at this moment in his hagiography. Uh, but on the other hand, notice uh, this slight blossoming of the cranial protuberance on the top of his head. So that the, um, the Ushnisha, and that's kind of a foreshadowing that, yeah, you're going to get it and you're, you're actually on the way. Also, unusual um, within Asian Buddhist, or within non-South Asian Buddhist art, um, we have the figure of uh, Siddhartha Gautama, the, the Buddha to be um, depicted as a, well, intending to be depicted as a South Asian. Now, um, we've seen countless Buddhas in Japan that are shown as Japanese, cast in the ethnicity of the artist in the audience. And for some reason, it's much more common in Zen to depict the Buddha as South Asian, or at least an effort to do so. And so what I mean by that is um, we've got him look at being hairier as people imagine South Asians to be, and a larger nose. That's really the smoking gun, the stereotypical smoking gun that the word had gotten to Japan that people in South Asia, they somehow thought that they would necessarily have larger noses. So that becomes part of the iconography in Zen. Oh, this style of brush painting, rather than being shie in Chinese or painting the idea of a calligraphic brush stroke, um, this is a type of brush painting in Chinese that is called gongbai or meticulous brush painting. Very much more laborious, much more detailed. Now, even in um, uh, uh, Japanese uh, Zen, painting. Um, this is an example of a hanging scroll, kakemono, with um, uh, this more meticulous painting, ink and color on silk, but that depicts um, uh, Siddhartha Gautama as being, um, a, a being disheveled, kind of struggling on the spiritual path. Now, these are typically titled Shakyamuni, Descending from the Mountain, uh, although properly speaking, it is Siddhartha descending from the mountain, because he's not yet the Buddha. Um, he, he, uh, as he is still 
subject to, he's not enlightened, he's still subject to human emotions. He looks despondent. He looks like he's saying, oh my gosh, I'm never going to be, I'm never going to get it. But um, in this anonymous hanging scroll from the 15th century, we do see the radiance of the halo and the, well, here for some reason, we've got not just one, but uh, two cranial protuberances, the um, the Ushnishas. But again, like we saw um, in the Chinese example from the Southern Song, uh, the Leng Kai's painting, we've got the dirty, tattered robes, the unshaven face. The Buddha uh, is almost never, and I mean, even depictions of Siddhartha uh, pre Buddhahood are very seldomly depicted with. Um, with uh, facial hair. And he even in this painting even has the urna. Um, so he's about to get it even if he doesn't know it. Uh, another <clears throat> Southern Song depiction in uh, the Xie or the much more sketchy calligraphic depiction. So this is the Chinese um, prototype, these hanging, uh, hanging scrolls. Uh, here in very Chinese um, fashion, the calligraphic inscription, and here it reads, entering the mountains, he became completely emaciated. Over the snow, he was wrapped in frosty cold. With cool eyes, he saw a star. Why did he emerge among men? Why did he go back? Why, did he, why didn't he just stay there? An open-ended question, but um, in typical Chan slash um, uh, slash uh, Zen um, style, he's shown in, with these very calligraphic brushstrokes and um, being completely uh, disheveled. And a um, Murumachi, Ashikaga Murumachi, anonymous Japanese Zen depiction of the same, but here in monochrome ink. I love the way he's depicted with this kind of um, the very economy of brush strokes. If, if you omitted any of these brush strokes, we wouldn't be able to tell what this figure was. But also the very, very, um, very different um, brush strokes showing the artist, the anonymous artist, complete mastery of different types of brush stroke and different um, mastery of different brushes. Thicker, more saturated, fatter brush, and then very thin um, brush to just execute this fine line of his eyes here. And I love these dirty, almost beastly feet with the talonous toenails. So what I focused on until now is depictions that are much sketchier, much um, minimalistic, cartoon-like, uh, that by, most of them don't have color. And really, in fact, um, in Zen art, so Zen works on paper, there are two types of um, paintings or portraits uh, of um, especially um, patriarch figures or um, priest figures. So we've seen the sketchier kind of every man unflattering paintings, the hanging scrolls. I want to turn to another genre of Chan, Song, and um, Zen painting that are called Chinzo. Now these Chinzo are portraits of uh, Zen priests, very high-ranking Zen priests or abbots. Abbots are mm, the head of a, uh, a temple or a monastery. And um, I think the most, uh, they're called, the Chinzo is the Japanese name for this uh, type of painting. And um, this is one of the most celebrated ones and um, in East Asia. It's a portrait and an inscription of um, the Zen master who was an abbot of the Jingshan Rinzai Monastery, uh, Wu Jun Shifan. And he lived and um, uh, presided over a very celebrated Chan Monastery during the uh, Sung Dynasty, the Southern Sung Dynasty. Uh, this was painted, it's dated 
1238. It's a hanging scroll, ink and mineral pigment on silk. Now, these Chinzo portraits, they are really examples of incredible, almost photo realism. And um, this, it, uh, it depicts a uh, Wujun Shifan in paintings such as this, paintings such as this, um, they are a way to document the lineage from teacher to pupil. And they're often kept in a large meditational hall in their monasteries so you can chart the lineage. And we recognize them as individuals because they look like because they're each very idiosyncratic. They look like actual humans. Now, um, this, uh, this particular hanging scroll was br uh, brought to Japan by um, Wujun Shifan's student who had come from Japan. He was a monk named Emi Bingin. He'd studied with Wujun for a number of years, and then he decided he was going to go back to Japan and. Um, take what he had learned back to uh, Kamakura, um, back to Kamakura, Japan. And so Wujun Shifan gave him this um, painting, this portrait that he had done of himself, and he also executed the, uh, the calligraphy here. And so, and, and coming from the Chinese tradition, very much believed, very much subscribed to in Japan, coming from the Chinese tradition, there is this concept that someone's calligraphy, someone's writing, um, really is, it, it retains traces of who they are. It's in, in um, English, we, um, we, we call this, um, or it, it's kind of like the science of um, reading handwriting. Um, and so, um, but this is taken very seriously in East Asia. So this, it, this was uh, kind of um, the painting and the calligraphy bearing the likeness of Wu Jun and the calligraphy would really be a, uh, it, it was like Wu Jun's blessing that, um, any Binion had studied with him and he'd learned from him. And um, it was kind of his certificate of graduation almost. And uh, indeed it did survive the very lengthy trip back to Japan and it now lives in uh, Tufukuji and one of the um, treasures of that um, monastery and temple. Now the way in which uh, Wujun Shifan is depicted, very, very typical of Chan and um, Zen uh, abbots. He's seated on a chair, but in um, cross-legged style, and his um, brocaded slippers are on his footrest here. He is, he holds the staff of his office, and he wears a very elaborate um, brocaded silk cloak that is in the style, but certainly not the material of um, uh, typical monastic costume. And um, this one was given to Wu Jun Qifan by the um, Song Dynasty uh, uh, emperor at the time. So it shows him as being tied to the imperial household. And indeed, he was the most celebrated living um, a monk at the time. So these are painted from life and they chart the lineage. So it would go um, in meditation halls at these monasteries. Um, uh, it would be like spiritual family portraits. You'd have the teacher and then next to him the student and the student of the student, uh, et cetera. And they look like, rather than being these sketchy um, uh, patriarch paintings, they look like the people that they, uh, that they are. And this is a Japanese um, Chinzo painting. Uh, it is the painting of uh, Shunun Oki Myoha, and uh, it's, uh, it dates to the 14th century. 
Now notice the way in which he is seated in the very same way that we just saw Mujun uh, Shifan. See, and this is appropriated from the Chinese Chan tradition, seated on his chair, but in cross-legged position. The, um, the elaborate um, kind of appropriation of monastic costumes, the brocaded silk slippers here at the, on the footrest. And then rather than an elaborate staff, he's got this slim staff, which is called in um, Japanese Zen, the shipei. And in um, Zen monasteries, this is used to flack uh, novice monks on the on their back as if they fall asleep during meditation if their eyes like dharmas if their eyelids became heavy and the um the abbot would see that and he would just slap them on the back and then the novice monk would have to say would have to bow in gratitude because it's helping them on the <laughs> on the path to enlightenment Again, this is an example of um, the unity of painting, poetry, and calligraphy. And so we're reading this, um, this inscription right above, um, right above the abbot, which he wrote in his own hand. It's his own calligraphy. There are no eyes on his head. His eyebrows hang down below. This is everything. This is nothing. I also could not become a phoenix. What the heck does that mean? <laughs> it's so Zen. There is a, and more on this next class, there is a long tradition in Zen of what we call koan, or these, um, these nonsensical poems that they are just, huh? The idea is that you're supposed to think about them over and over and over again, and they mean nothing. And you're supposed to try and figure out what they mean, and you exhaust your mind, and you just kind of go, ah! And then that moment of giving up on the intellect, that is supposed to cause a moment of enlightenment, satori. And they're also very humorous. So there are no eyes in his head, what? Um, but yet we see eyes here. Uh, has a, and he is kind of parodying himself as an old man, and um, his eyebrows hang down. This is everything. This is nothing. That's the paradox here. And this also, what the heck does that mean? I also could not become a phoenix. Well, don't overthink it, or do overthink it, and turn your brain inside out and enjoy the satori that comes with that. Uh, so I'm going to end here, folks, and we will be looking at um, mostly landscape in Zen traditions next class. Be well.